Hi guys and welcome back to my spring upload spree! Today I initially wanted to talk about more tips and tricks on digital art because you guys seem to like the previous video a little bit! But it also got me thinking that we actually learn more from our mistakes rather than our successes so I went through some of my old digital art and well it's debatable whether it's pretty or not but <laughs> the thing is, I made a lot of quote-unquote mistakes when I got into digital art and the main reason for making these mistakes is because I didn't know any better. In the beginning I was half traditional, half digital and then I transitioned to 100% digital and that transition is not pretty. I think it's very clear that it looks like my skill level dropped but primarily it's because I don't know the medium that I'm working with. It's like asking a charcoal artist to make a masterpiece with watercolors. It's a completely different medium and it takes some time to get used to and the learning curve in the beginning can be quite steep but hopefully with some of the things that I can point out for you guys today you will transition much easier than I did and let me also put in a small disclaimer here that if you do any of these things that I mentioned in this video, it doesn't mean that you're a bad artist. Not at all, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that these are some things that I used to do, that when I changed my behavior and did something else, I could see an improvement in my art. And that's the aim of this video. Which, by the way, wouldn't have been possible for me to make in this tight schedule I have if it wasn't for today's sponsor. Once again, the amazing skills here. And once again, they also provided a URL that you can use to get two months free premium access to all of the content on their website. And in case you're sitting there like, hmm, I did watch the other free videos that were sponsored by the Skillshare, but I have no idea what it is. Allow me to explain. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes on art, design, business and more. Their premium membership gives you unlimited access to all of their classes and whether you're looking to learn something new or just want to brush up some old knowledge, you will most likely find it on Skillshare. I recently took this class on painting light and shadow, the basics for portraits and characters. And I really recommend it because people often ask me about lights and shadow and I bet you I can't do it any better than Gabrielle here. So if you're just going to watch one art class on Skillshare, I recommend that it be this one. So use the link in the description below to claim one of the 500 spots that I have for you guys for those two months free trial on Skillshare. And if you decide to stay on Skillshare after the trial has run out, their annual membership is less than $10 a month. Now to the actual video. <laughs> Oh my god, I'm so sorry, my introductions are always so damn long. <gasps> I'll stop now. Mistake number one. Not using a drawing tablet. You would do yourself a huge favor by having a drawing tablet because it will make your life so much easier. My first tablet was from some unknown brand I found at a local discount shop. <laughs> I paid 100 Danish kroner for it and I even managed to scratch it with a scissor upon unpacking it. It didn't perform very well, there was now this deep scratch in it I had to work around all the time and it didn't support pressure sensitivity. But I still used it to color my traditional scanned line art for almost two years before being able to or affording to buy my first vacuum bamboo tablet. Back then, about 15 years ago, damn I'm old, vacuum was the only tablet manufacturer I knew of and buying stuff over the internet at that time was still considered pretty sketchy. <laughs> so the bamboo was all that I could get my hands on. Hence I started using Wacom, Wacom, whatever you like to call them. It made my life so much easier and I believe I used that tablet for around 8 years before finally upgrading to a Cintiq. There are so many manufacturers of tablets today and you can get really decent tablets for far less money than I could 15 years ago. I just think digital art is hard <laughs> without a tablet and I wouldn't consider doing it at all. And some people actually get mad at me for saying that they should get a tablet if they want to be a digital artist, but honestly, how on earth do you plan to become a digital artist if you refuse to use the digital tools? I'm just asking. Okay. On to mistake number two, not using pressure sensitivity or not having a tablet that supports it. So by using pressure sensitivity, you have more control over your strokes and you can easily vary the weight of your line art as well. And it's also perhaps a matter of preference, but I still think drawings look less stiff and more pleasing to the eye 
when you have some vari 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 holy sh poo. variety <laughs> when you have variety in your line work more lines in your line work holy day it has been a long day doing digital art on a tablet without pressure sensitivity is like drawing traditionally with a pencil where you are not allowed to add or release pressure from your pen, but you'll be forced to always use the same force onto the paper. I know there are some styles where you just want to have evenly lines and that's fine, but just consider the pressure sensitivity because in case you need it, it's there. Mistake number three, painting with the airbrush. I was so guilty um, of being excited about the airbrush and I thought I could use it to blend and shade beautifully but it just turns out that my art looked unfocused, effortless, lack of contrast. There is a neat trick that I learned from watching speed paints by Sakimi-chan, an amazing digital artist who actually used the airbrush a lot. After painting an area, Sakimi-chan showed how using the lasso tool to turn the soft edges sharp by deleting the blurriness gave a really nice contrast between the soft and the hot look. This trick stuck from the moment I learned it and I've been using it religiously ever since. It is especially good if you want to do lineless illustrations. Mistake number four, overblending. This is one of the mistakes that I can sometimes still be a little guilty of committing even today. It's so easy to get carried away towards a perfect smooth blending when in reality sometimes rougher is better oh my hand <laughs> over blending can sometimes appear as blocks of smooth surfaces that look unnatural compared to the areas around it other times blending too much will result in the shading looking completely absent which more resembles a gradient of colors rather than actual shading to counter this, try to have a mix of smooth blended surfaces and harder edges or even textures so you have a little more contrast in your paintings because that's something our eyes are naturally drawn to, contrast. And since we're already on this topic, the next mistake is using gradients for shading. Gradients are not prohibited. They can be very useful, especially for adding color variation onto an element, but using it as a substitute for shading can look very effortless, like if you're not even trying. In these early examples from more than 10 years ago, I used gradients instead of actually applying shadows and highlight properly, especially on clothing and backgrounds I didn't care much for, or if I needed to work really fast. When I use gradients today, I use them in an earlier stage of the drawing to determine which kind of color variation I want to use in a specific area. I especially use them when painting hair and I even normally use a big airbrush instead of the actual gradient tool. I still use gradients a lot on backgrounds, especially when you're painting skies because that's one of the things they're perfect for, but I still use it to just have it as a first fill layer, then I build all of the details and the contrast on top of it. Mistake number six, using smudging wrong. The smudge tool can be a very powerful ally on your digital art journey, if you know how to use it properly. So what is incorrect smudge tool use? Well, as it sounds by its name, the brush smudges things together. It's kind of like having a pencil sketch and then use your fingers or a smudge pen or blending tip or whatever they're called to blend the graphite together except Photoshop's standard smudge tool doesn't do a very good job at it. More or less just looks like it doesn't blend the things together, but just apply the things on top of each other. You can agree with me maybe when looking at this that it doesn't look so neat. <laughs> like with most other tools in Photoshop, you can change the brush that the tool is using. The brush I used for smudging was made by Bansif from DeviantArt, who created this brush for the smudge tool to achieve a blender that simulates the watercolor brush from Paint to Sai as closely as possible. So simply by changing the tool's brush, you now have a blender that smoothly blends your colors together and doesn't leave those ugly streaks. It's easy to get carried away with this amazing blender though, so be careful not to overblend. Mistake number seven, 
saving the image raw. When you save out your image, there are usually a lot of different file formats that you can choose from. The most popular back when I got started was JPEG, because the files were just smaller. JPEG just so happens to compress your image a lot, and even though it has definitely become better over time, it is still considered a very lossy image format, meaning that it throws away a lot of information about your image in order to retain a smaller file size. Instead, you should use PNG formats if you wish to have less compression, and Photoshop even asks you whether you want to save it as compressed as possible or as lossless as possible. And PNG also supports transparent backgrounds. Mistake number eight, not using the full potential of your drawing software, AKA your digital tools. I know that many of you use other painting software than Photoshop, but Photoshop isn't the only software that has a lot of helpful features. So don't get discouraged by this point or mistake point, because the general mistake made here accounts for all software. If you don't use the tools that digital art has available to you, why do digital art at all, I ask again. Research what your drawing software offers to you. While I don't have a lot of experience outside of Photoshop, some of my preferred software features that I wish I knew back when I get started was shortcut to checking your values, multiple instances of the same drawing open, layers, masking, all these little adjustment layers that you can use to tweak your drawing, flipping your canvas, and of course the liquify tool. And that's just a small portion of the tools that I'm using today. They would have made my life a lot easier if I had known them when I got started with digital art. Just by the way that most software is displaying the color wheel is actually a huge help to you because you can easily spot, for instance, complementary colors. Mistake number nine, zooming in too much and or working too small. It's too easy to get lost in the details when you can zoom in as far as 800% of your canvas size. I've been doing this a lot until actually very recently and no one sees the details I make when I'm zoomed in at around 400 anyways. I've been looking and asking around about this actually and I found that there are two general rules of thumb that I'll remember going forward. And those are, you should not zoom in more than 100% if you want everything you draw to be visible at a distance. It is okay to zoom in more than 100% to have more control over your strokes, but you shouldn't be working at creating details when being zoomed too much in. When you upload your image to the internet or print it out, you are not going to see it as big as the 100% is presented to you on the screen. You will most likely get it scaled down to around 70% or something like that. And if you hang the image on the wall, most people will like to see it from a distance rather than smashing their face against it all day. <laughs> Which leads to the second rule of thumb. Prioritize that the drawing looks great from a distance rather than close up. I've come around this problem by working on much larger canvases. The size I used to work on was equivalent to an A4 paper. The size I work on now is equivalent to an A3 paper at 300 dpi, which is around 3500 by 5000 pixels, around that. When working on a bigger canvas, I can zoom in much more without going over 100%. It's hard to get used to not zooming in too much, I admit that, especially if you've been doing it all this time like I have. But I'm sure we will all come around at some point now I just hate the thought of I have been working on so many tiny details that no one else but me can see because I know that they are there. <laughs> oh well. And mistake number 10 is relying too much on brushes. So sometimes, guys, when we see a piece of art that we consider a new masterpiece, something we look up to and strive to be able to create ourselves, we want to ask this artist, what brushes they use because if we use their tools we ought to be able to create something as beautiful as them right wrong <laughs> big fat beeping wrong it's not about what tool they're using but more how they're using it i had a brush at some point that was supposed to be great for creating hair texture 
and it is, but just not the way that I used it. You can clearly see in this drawing how I just drew with the hairbrush on top of the color block to create hair. I'm not sure what kind of magic I was expecting to happen when I used this brush, but it's definitely not magic-ish and it looks horrible. I'm not even following the natural flow of the hair, I'm simply just all over the place with this brush. It is a mistake that if we have the professional brushes, we can make professional art. Sure, a brush can help you get some of that texture that otherwise would be hard to create yourself in large areas and in some cases they are very helpful, but brushes are not a shortcut to good art as I wish they had been back when I got into digital art for the first time. A typical response I get when I upload a drawing is What are these brushes? What brushes did you use? Where can I get your brushes? And when they find out I'm just using the sponge tool along with an airbrush and a hard brush with some transfer on it, they get super disappointed because they were expecting a big folder of ready to click and apply brushes that will make their drawing dance for them. Let's stop obsessing over this wishful thinking that brushes is the perfect shortcut to everything in art and that we can create better pieces if we have better brushes because that's just not the case. It depends on how you use them and you're able to create just as good art with a standard brush set than with some fancy one you bought for $100 or whatever. Don't feel like you're being held back because you don't think you have the right brush set or something. Nothing is holding us back from using what is just available to us. Sure, I use a few different brushes and I downloaded a whole bunch of them, but in reality I only use around 5% of those brushes because I found the few that makes my work look like I wanted to. So that was it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it and found it useful or just entertaining, if not anything else. Remember to use that code in the description below so you can see some classes for free on Skillshare and hopefully I will see you again very soon. Take care, bye bye.